I would normally give people time to trickle in after lunch, but I did this presentation twice on Saturday and had an hour and 10 minutes and I ran out of time both times. So in 50 minutes, uh, I'm gonna try to move a little faster, but uh, we'll see how far we get. That being said, um, I'm gonna skip this screen because it's easier to read on this one depending on the projector. So my name is Leslie Prawley Osborne. I am an instructional technology and social studies consultant at Prairie Lakes AEA. Um, all of the resources for this session can be found on the iTech resource page, but if you want to go directly there, um, my bit.ly is there. It is case sensitive, so it's capital L-P-O presents, along with my Twitter handle slash Instagram handle. It's just kind of me. Um, all the resources, so the slide deck for this is there. There's resources in the speaker notes that I want to make sure you know about because sometimes people don't click through to go to the speaker notes, so there's stuff in there. And then um, on the side, there's two or three more Google Docs linked just of stuff that if you have all of your free time as educators, right? Um, but if this is a topic that interests you or you hear something, there are lots and lots of things there to dig through. Um, when I come across stuff I like, I throw it on a Google Doc and save it that way. So there's that. You will have to scroll down. So if you get to the page and it's not the first one, it's because I had another session this morning. Um, and instead of pasting this one twice in a row, like I said, I did it Saturday. Um, so it's a second presentation down if you're looking for this one on that page. Let's see, did I talk long enough that everybody could get the bit.ly? I just kind of ramble so that people have time to get that. That's my MO pretty much every presentation. Cool. So a little bit about where this came from. Um, last year, if you attended iTech, Ken Shelton was uh, one of the keynotes, and he was amazing, first of all. Second of all, he really got me thinking about this idea of techquity and how we can leverage technology in the world of equity and bringing, um, not only bringing technology to the classroom to enhance those things, but also that tech Technology is sort of that piece that is an equalizer, and without it, you can't really have an equitable classroom. You need that piece in place. And so, um, sort of this uh, equity, diversity, education, whatever kind of buzzwords you want to put into it, journey that I had been on, um, it challenged me in a new way, because now I'm thinking about it in my role as a tech consultant, not just maybe a social studies lens or a personal lens or, you know, this is the work that I enjoy doing most and now I get to tie it all together. So a little bit about that, but I do want to give proper credit to Ken Shelton because he really sort of sparked this um, tech part of the journey for me. I would like you each to ignore technology for a minute, take out a piece of paper, a pencil, you can do it in the notes on your phone, you can do it on your computer. Um, I just need you to be able to make a list and I need you to be able to delete or cross things off that list. I personally find satisfaction in the crossing off but if you prefer to do it on your phone, that's cool too. I don't know what I'm competing against that there's giggling and tigers going on, but thank you for choosing to come sit with me. Um, okay, so I first did this activity at a teaching tolerance workshop up in Minneapolis a little over a year ago. So if you have done one of their workshops, you maybe have done this before. Um, there are other organizations and groups that do something similar. Uh, but I think it can be a really powerful way to kick off our conversation. So um, I'm going to ask you to make a list and identify, self-identify each of these things. So for yourself, what would you identify as your gender, your sexual orientation, um, and so on down the list. This list is only for you. I'm not gonna look at it. Your name, you guys are sitting really close, so you don't just cover your paper, right? Um, no, but it's only for you. I'm not gonna look at it. You're not going to be asked to share it in any way. Um, this list is for you personally. So going through your identified race, socioeconomic status, immigration status, or national, nation of origin, um, home language, religion, or, and I still need to edit this slide, belief system, or better descriptive word, because I'm still on this journey and I need to find a better word than just religion. Um, and then ability. More often than not, I have someone ask to clarify ability. So ability versus like a disability, if you identify in some way as having um, something that might fall under that category. 
I'm going to give you a couple minutes without me talking. As you're finishing up your lists, that was not a couple minutes of not me talking, but we'll roll with it. As you're finishing up your list, I'm going to tell you that the pacing of this activity is intentional and it will possibly be uncomfortable and bear with me if you would. Okay, so you should have eight items on your list. Of the eight items on your list, I would like you to cross off the one that is least essential to the person that you are today. And if you have done this before, I would love to have you do it again, and I'll ask at the end. Of the seven items still on your list, please cross off the one that is least essential to the person you are today. Of the six remaining items on your list, please cross off the one that is least essential to the person you are today. Of the five remaining items on your list, please cross off the one that is least essential to the person you are today. Of the four remaining items on your list, please cross off the one that is least essential to the person you are today. Of the three items left on your list, please cross off the one that is least essential to the person you are today. Am I down to you? Of the final two items, I never keep track of the numbers. Of the final two items, please cross off the one that is least essential to the person that you are today. Circle the final one and take a minute to just process the word that you are left with. Now again, I'm not going to ask you to share your word. Um, teaching tolerance really encouraged people to keep that private. I am a rule breaker, and if you feel the need to share your word as you share the process or the story, um, go ahead. Because sometimes it's just hard to illustrate your point without that. If you don't want to, you are not at all obligated to. How did this process make you feel? Annoyed. Totally valid. Did anyone quit before they got to the end? Gold star. Like, usually I have someone say, I'm not doing it. I can't. It's the last two or three. Like, I'm not crossing any more off. Yeah? It just makes me question what was essential, like, out of the list to, like, survive or be able to function in my life. So that's interesting. How, without giving anything that you don't want to share, but like, would you be willing to share your process of sort of how you did go through that? I, I've done it before, and I wish I had my list, and I don't know what I. Yeah, because I'm curious. Like, for people who have done it before, like, did you end up with the same word? Um, but I do remember the last time I did it. Well, I I ended up with the ability able body because I feel like I at the end of the day with everything stripped away I can do work to provide for my family or my wife. I have that right now with what I can. And so that is the conversation, the process I went through the last time I know I ended up in a similar place that you know, thinking about what's essential for survival. I did that same thing and I have language but then there was some guilt about that because I don't I don't I was like the conflicting within myself I was frustrated that that was my last one because I still have to think the language needs but the same kind of thing like I speak English I don't speak any other languages I'm not <laughs> that intelligent so I feel like that's what allows me to be who I am and that I can communicate with the masses in the community in which I live 
Um, but I was also so frustrated because I, I don't sound like anybody that doesn't speak English. I actually think we're probably way smarter than I am because they probably speak English and something else. Or, but I'm best able to communicate in a world of English. Thank you. Was anyone influenced by the phrase today in my prompt? Cross off, or did you just sort of cross away as you needed to? Because that was one when I did this as a participant that really stuck out at me, like who I am today. And I, can, I will tell you that when I did this, it was like the height of Kavanaugh Me Too, and woman was my final word. And I don't know if I were to be in the participant seat again and doing it again, if I would end up in the same space. Like I've not been put in a place where I had to process that. But that was so important, regardless of which side you fall on, right? Like you could be pro Kavanaugh, against Kavanaugh, but like that was essential to conversation in politics and society at the time. And so I just wonder, like, would I have chosen differently? Race and gender were both for me today because I know that they're different for other people in the last hundred years, you know, like, so I did think about it, like, because I have to teach an entire race and diversity unit in my class, race, specific, or cultural diversity unit in my class, and so we'll talk about all those things and how they change over time. So I did think about that, but I've been able to do that several years ago. Yeah, that's a good point. My socioeconomic status has changed. It's significantly different now than it was 15 years ago. I found myself crossing off the ones I most took for granted. Like, oh, yeah, I don't have to think about that one. Like, you can go. So, I don't know. It's just, I like to hear about people's processes. Um, I will tell you, when I did this, we had a small group at our table. So, I shared that mine was woman. The woman sitting next to me um, had the most, like, I don't her life story was insane, right? Like had been in a very low socioeconomic status position, sexual abuse survivor, um, African-American woman. So dealing with things in her community um, in regard to that. And she's sharing these stories. And she said, my word though that I'm left with is minister, is religion because she was a minister. And that was the thing that at her very core, her belief system was what was going to be her thing. And the woman across from her said, mine is nation of origin and she was from Peru and so even though she's here living in a new country it was important to her that she not lose that piece of her so it's interesting just like how different people's play like we're all women sitting at a table at the same conference but all of these different backgrounds and pieces played out I'm going to ask you to keep that in mind as we go through these pieces because those are the pieces and probably a whole lot more that I could add to this list that each of your students brings to your classroom every single day and I wonder how often they feel like they're being asked to cross things off. Or how often they're being recognized as just one of the things that they are. And so I want you to hold that in mind. I had a guy on Saturday tell me they did this activity, but they passed their paper and someone else crossed off for you. And so it sort of gave this authenticity of the role that other people assign to you. I don't feel comfortable with that because I feel like this is a very personal list and I'm not going to have you share it with strangers, but I thought it was an interesting twist on the activity that I would share today. So, digging into the actual content. I want us to really think about this idea that we want to reach every kid every day and I picked it because it sounds like one of those throwaway phrases that, yeah, we say, but we really need to mean, right? Like, it really needs to be every kid every day and that means understanding that culture matters it means understanding that all of those pieces of them matter it means that we as educators have a duty to support this meaningful change and we have a really like the luxury of having a job that we can do that right we can support that and then finally remembering that relationships and building and getting to know people are literally the answer to everything in education. Like, if you have a question about education, I'm pretty sure the answer to solving it is relationships. So, it has not proved me or like failed me yet, but we'll see. A little bit about me. Um, this is my family. This is the part where I get to brag about my kids, right? Um, 
I have four of them. I'm working on number five, which basically makes me insane. But as I say that, people are like, oh no, I have six. And like, I never knew there were so many people who also have five and six children until I was going to have a fifth child. Um, but this picture is important to me because I want to share with you, this journey is really new to me. Um, my background is political science, taught social studies, six through 12th grade, like super fun, love social studies, got into tech, started coming to iTech, that's the job I took at the agency. Three years ago, I started dating my now husband. Um, we got married two years ago. This picture was taken a year ago. Don't ask me how that plays out. Um, <laughs> don't tell, we had a secret wedding before the baby was born. Um, but I came to the very real understanding as a mother that my boys will have one experience in life as middle-class white males. My daughter, my oldest here, will have a slightly different experience from them. But my youngest, Evelyn, and now youngest two, will have very different experiences from their siblings. And I don't know, I'm sure as a mom, I get emotional. I'm pregnant, everything makes me emotional, <laughs> right? Um, but as a mom, coming to this understanding, that's my kid, and that's not okay. And so as teachers, I think you guys will feel me on this, but every kid in those seats is my kid, right? I've been out of the classroom, this will be seven years now, which is way too many. Um, I'm going back soon, I swear. But every kid is your kid, right? The kid I see at hy V, like getting groceries with her babies now, she's still my kid. And the guy who's fixing my car because he noticed my headlight was out, like, he's still my kid. So all these years removed, they've graduated, I've been out of the classroom, they're still my kids. And for each of you, I, I'm guessing you probably have kids that are similar. Like, they're yours, they're your class, they're your kids. And so when I say every kid, I mean it because we as teachers really do have this opportunity to connect with every kid. Cornelius Snyder wrote a book called We Got This. It's phenomenal if you haven't read it, all about connecting with kids and making change and all the, I don't know, it's all the things, right? Like it's rooted in equity and he has these great graphics. But he talks about this idea of building bridges for children um, between what they're doing in class and what they're doing in their lives. And so I want to make sure that we're connecting to that. So the work that I want to share with you today, you may have seen in the description, um, is largely from Zaretta Hammond's Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain. And so after I heard Ken Shelton's speech, I sort of was like, okay, but what is, like what are the actionable things for culturally responsive teaching? And so I went to her book, read it in one day because it was like fascinating. It's like midnight that night and I'm finishing the last pages and my husband's like, can we please turn the light off already? Um, but I finished it and it was amazing and it is the most like dog-eared, highlighted, sticky-noted book on my bookshelf. But then I was like, okay, now what do I do with this? So I wanted to find some tools. So she talked about using the brain's memory system to access deeper learning. Um, when we have these pieces, we know that when we pull on background knowledge, we can attach deeper, richer meaning to students' understanding. And then she goes into things like making sure students have appropriate challenges. <coughs> and accessing things like oral tradition. Having culturally relevant examples. And authentic processing opportunities. And all of these are part of information processing that we need to help students access. So EdTech Me is like, okay, cool, what tools can we pull in? So appropriate challenge was a little bit harder, so I dug into oral tradition and I want to share a few favorites with you. So Flipgrid. Are you all using Flipgrid? I see some nods. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so this is where I skip. There we go. Flipgrid is a video response tool. Um, it's very user-friendly. Microsoft bought it and made it free for all educators. You can lock it down so that it's just your class and they have to have the private code and email address to be involved. You can open it up so it's completely public and shared with the world. They added a bunch of new features so you can embed your things like Google Docs, you can embed YouTube videos, pictures, um, you can add filters. It has fun little like put on your pirate hat and the parrot on your shoulder and your eye patch because some kids don't want to be on video. I don't love being on video. This is awkward right now. <laughs> um, but they give you the stickers and fun things to play with, right? But what Flipgrid gives us is an opportunity to tell stories. And I love when my sessions connect to the keynotes. 
So we're telling stories, and not only are you telling a story, but you get the chance to narrate your story. So you can hear my voice, you can hear my enthusiasm and my excitement, you can tell my tone, you can see my facial expressions as long as you don't have too many eye patches and things covering your face, right? Like there's all these extra pieces of the narrative when we can access these storytelling features. The next one I want to share with you is Synth. Synth is a micro-podcasting app. Podcasting has seen this resurgent in recent years, and I say app. So it is an app, it is mobile device friendly, but it also has a website, so you could do it in a web-based browser. Pretty much everything I share with you, except the next one, is going to be free and device agnostic. So no matter what device you're on, um, you should be able to access it with your students. There are a couple exceptions, but I felt like they were too good to skip. Synth gives you 256 seconds, don't ask why, to create a, um, a micro-podcast. So you can attach an image or a link with it. You can give your prompts. So I started doing it as like book talks with myself. Um, you can see that I'm a hugely popular synth broadcaster by my seven plays and my three plays on my um, listening pieces here. But for me it was, okay, I'm reading this book. I want to process what I've read, so I would share. And then I would read the next chapter or section and I'd need to process what I said. And so I wanted to make sure. And then, oh, I saw a Des Moines Register article that don't read the comments, but sometimes you can read the articles. Um, a Des Moines Register article. So I just sort of logged for myself. Students could do this, right? Like I could set up a prompt as a teacher and the students reply, and then we play it through like a podcast. So it could be a playlist. Or students could have an initial prompt, and then they keep adding to their thinking line of learning style kind of thing. So a bunch of different ways you can use this, and again, this one is free. The one I want to share with you that is not free, are any of you using Soundtrack? Okay, so you can get the free version. You can also get the free trial. Soundtrack for Education is the only version of it that is like COPA compliant, FERPA, all those fun acronyms that make sure we're safe for kids. Um, they're kind of important, but it is a music creation app or program. I keep saying app, it's a website or an app. Um, so now kids are not only able to podcast, they can create their own original compositions to go with it. So not only am I telling you my story, I'm creating the music that goes along with it and sets the mood for that and enhances the message and takes the storyline to that next level. What's really cool is my dear friend, I used to work with her, actually works for Soundtrap now, um, Meredith Allen. Some of you may know her, she's from Iowa. Um, it's really cool and will extend your educator trial. Um, so if you are interested in trying Soundtrap out and you want an extended version, grab one of my cards, email me, and I'll hook you up with her. Guys, you can do a whole project with a class in 30 days, and then you don't necessarily need to buy it again. You could, because it's an awesome program, and that's why I shared this paid one. Um, but definitely worth giving a try, and she's very cool and willing to do that. So thinking about a few others, I'm going to tell you a piece of this story. So my husband hates that I put blackish on this screen. Um, and I'm going to use his point as an illustration of my point. Right? Like, there are so many spaces that we can get different perspectives. And there are so many perspectives, right? We can't have one space that is the mouthpiece for any given area. But in a world of Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime and YouTube TV and whatever other streaming devices, cable, sure, I guess, um, other documentary places, stuff, I don't know. I lost my train of thought. But, like, we have access to so many things. So he hates that I use Blackish because he does not like Anthony Anderson. He thinks he's not a good mouthpiece for black culture. His opinion, totally respect it. I share it for that reason, like opposite opinion. I like it because I love Tracy Ellis Ross and she often shares on her Instagram like when they have a particularly poignant episode. So I will be very honest, I had no idea about like colorism until Tracy Ellis Ross put on her Instagram their colorism episode and said, I'm really proud of this one. So I went to Hulu, watched it, and was like, oh my gosh, like this whole other world opens up, right? They have a Black History Month episode that's, I mean, it's funny because it's entertainment, right? 
but it's all about like the gender that plays within it. Like we focus on all these men and we only focus on this during Black History Month and these men get all the spotlight, but what about the women or what about the, the people that are doing things today versus historically? So there's some really, like there's the funny episodes because it is meant to be entertainment, but there's some really good conversations. Again, one piece, right? So the other space I send you to is I grab um, When They See Us as an example of a documentary. There are so, so many documentaries and whether it's religion or health or race or criminal justice, right? Like there's all these worlds that we can explore. And so we really have no reason to not have culturally relevant examples and modern examples for all of our kids in our classroom. And I don't expect you to spend hours watching television, but an hour here and an hour there can really expand. I listen to like audiobooks on my ride in my car because I work for the ADA and all we do is drive sometimes it feels like. Um, so there's all these spaces and I just want to encourage some of those. I put Thumbtrap again because they uh, partnered with a school system but it was part of the juvenile justice system and the students put together these original like sort of spoken word um, songs, I guess, but like more poetry feeling, many of them. Anyway, but like sharing their story and their journey through the juvenile justice system, or sometimes bigger than that picture, like that's not just who I am, right? So I think it's a great illustration, and these are hyperlinked um, on the slides and in the speaker notes. But I just think it's a great illustration of getting outside ourselves and outside our box of places that we can get this information. Finally, some feedback. We know that feedback in education is important. We know that timely and meaningful feedback is important. Um, I just wanted to share a few of my favorites and I actually would have you participate in one of them. So working backwards, not that backwards, um, back channel chat. If you use today's meet as a back channel, that went away about a year ago. Um, so back channel chat is a good substitute for that. Hi, Zena. Um, looks a little like Starbucks there, but is an audio, um, like you leave voice clips for students embedded within their Google Docs. So if you are a Google school and wanting to leave those voice feedback pieces, I think that one's very cool. It's an extension for Chrome. Um, Pear Deck is another space where you can get interactive with students and see what they're doing. Flipgrid was worth putting again. And then the one I wanna share with you is Mentimeter. So how many of you have used Mentimeter? One or two? Okay. So Mentimeter, I'm actually going to, because I want to show you how easy this is to set up. So you go to Mentimeter.com. I already have an account. Um, you can create a free account. So I go to my every kid every day. I've clearly used this before. Um, you can filter profanity. So if somebody asked me about that in my last session, you're gonna have kids throwing answers up on the screen. Maybe you want to sort of have a filter that goes along with that, depending on the age level you're working with. But what I can do is change the different types. So they have points and word clouds and different forms. Some of them you'll see are free, are free and some of them are paid. So you have some different options here. I want to not be able to find what I was looking for. That's okay. There it is. So I can reset the results. So I could do this between every class period and use the same one. Um, and have it build off of, or I could reset it so the kids aren't getting answers from the class before. And so hopefully you can see that. I'm gonna have you go to menti.com, and the code you're gonna use is 623944. And I'd love for you to jump on your device, your computer, your phone. Um, they do have a texting option, I think, but I typically stick with the web version. Um, it's just a little easier, and then you don't have to worry about texting and message rates, although I don't know anyone that doesn't have unlimited texting at this point in life, but maybe. Um, so I'm going to have you go ahead and fill this out. What opportunities do or could you offer to support information processing for all students in your classroom?
this could be an example of something you already do, and it could be, I want to try that app you just talked about, or that website you just talked about. As you can see, it updates in real time, and I start getting student responses. Um, I like this, and again, you have to know your audience of whether you're going to allow them to put anonymous things up, right? If you are thinking, I really need, maybe I have an immature group this year, or they're not ready, something like a back channel chat might be better, where they're going to put in their name and you have teacher moderation. Um, what I like about this one is how visual it is. It's very aesthetically pleasing, which is the professional way of saying it's super pretty. Um, I like that it scrolls. I had like 75 people do this, so you could have kids doing like multiple answers if you wanted to, and I don't run out of, it doesn't cap it that I've run into. Um, so I really like that feature about it. And it will stay there and keep adding and just sort of filter through. I'm gonna keep us moving. I know there were only seven responses. That was just about all of us. Um, so I wanna talk about this idea of awareness. So Reddit Human talks about awareness. Um, largely for the teacher point of view. Like, do I understand my own lens and my own interpretations? But I think those are just as important for students as we help them navigate the world around them. So we need to be able to broaden our perspectives and that's how we can learn to see the world differently, but we need to be exposed to those perspectives first. I love this quote from Duran McKesson. You'll also notice that there's lots of books and people referenced in my slide deck, so if you're ever looking for something to add to your reading list, his book, On the Other Side of Freedom, um, was excellent, the one I read last spring. So when we're thinking about awareness, we need to have an understanding of many, many things. And I preface, no, I don't preface, because I already said it, but I want to add to that that we will never know all of the things. And so the ability to apologize and also the ability to know that sometimes an apology isn't enough and you just have to be okay with that um, are very important skills. I don't know all those pieces of my students that are coming into the classroom or all of those pieces of my colleagues. I can attempt to be sensitive to things and I can learn from my mistakes, um, but sort of being aware of those things. So we need to understand socio-political context of things. We live in a world, you guys, where Casey's Pizza is political. Like, I don't know how it happened, but Casey's Pizza is political. Casey's also should be a corporate sponsor because now it's at least two shout outs they've gotten today, um, although the keynote probably was a much bigger deal. Um, we need to understand triggers. So I had a friend yesterday, where, who was here yesterday? Yesterday, um, the keynote talked about her process of like a period of infertility in her life and I had a friend say I really wish she would have announced a trigger warning ahead of that. So it was really difficult for her to hear. Um, and I said, you know, like I've been there too, like I understand what you're saying, but you just never know, right? Like how, how does a keynote know? But we do need to be aware of things that might trigger others. Um, we need to broaden our interpretations and our own understanding. And in addition to that, know our own lens. So I don't know, I don't know if you know this, but it probably won't surprise you. This is a terrible slide to have or a terrible image to have on a slide, but I want you to have it in the speaker notes. So you will notice up here, the United States is at the very top, not because it's the best, but I mean, you might think that, that's cool, right? Like we're all from different spaces. It's at the very top because the United States is the most individualistic society in the world. I don't know if you're surprised by this. I was not necessarily, 
Um, down here is Guatemala. On this list, and this is not all of the countries in the world, but on this list, Guatemala is the most collectivist society. And so again, not good or bad or best or worse, just opposite ends of the spectrum. And I've just, this sort of makes that unclear when it's laid out that way, so I want to make sure I point that out. Um, so the student that I have that's always up out of her seat and working with someone else, and she's always talking and running around the room, like, I don't know that her background isn't from a much more collectivist society. And maybe what my interpreted disruption is, or inability to sit still, is her trying to help the greater good, right? Like, in my society or in my culture, it is a point of pride to go help others. And so there are other pieces to think about, and that really stood out to me. Um, she tells another story where, I didn't know this, and looking at me, you'll understand why I probably didn't know this, but she tells a story where there is um, a white teacher and an African-American student, and the teacher says, um, would you like to return to your seat? He's sharpening his pencil. And he does not. He continues sharpening his pencil. And so she sends him to the office for being defiant because he wouldn't return to his seat. Phrasing commands as a question is a very white middle class thing to do. Didn't know, because that's what I grew up with. But when you, she asked him a question, would you like to return to your seat? Like, no, I'm sharpening my pencil right now. You gave me the option, right? But like one interpretation is very different than the other. And so we run into these things, and she just tells some of these stories that like really stuck out to me. It's, oh my gosh, I never would have even thought about that that way. And so a couple of things. Um, one I want to share with you is this visual thinking guide from Manuel Herrera and Sadie Lewis. And in it, there is an empathy map. So yay, graphic organizers. I'm a big fan. The whole book or PDF is about different strategies for helping kids think visually. Um, sort of sketch notes, but more about the thinking than the artistry. And in it is this empathy map. So it looks at, you could look at characters in a book, right? You could look at historical figures. You could look at my friend on the playground. But it asks you to think about the other person's perspective and what they're seeing and what they're hearing and what they're feeling. And it just gives it a really nice laid out, like I said, graphic organizer to put yourself in someone else's shoes. There's lots of other cool tools in that book. That one's most relevant to this conversation. A couple of other pieces um, in terms of knowing your own lens. There is an unconscious bias like educator handbook that helps you do a self-assessment of where your biases might lie. Um, if you have not heard of Harvard's Project Implicit, um, they have a series of quizzes and you actually have to click on the quiz or like click the disclaimer that says, I understand that I may not like or agree with these results before you take it. Um, I used to have people do it, but it takes probably 10 to 20 minutes. Um, and that's a, most of my session. So it's worth the 10 to 20 minutes. It's not a big chunk of your time, but they have them on race. They have them on gender. They have them on religion. They have them on political issues um, and all through. And it measures to an extent your unconscious preferences for one thing over another. And it's hard. I think one time I was able to take a quiz where I got like neutral. And every other time I've come up with, you have a mild preference for X or you have a moderate preference for X. And it's not an easy answer to be, like an easy result to be given, but it's something that we can discover within ourselves. Um, anymore, I just had the opportunity to hear him for the second time this year, but he does a 21 day racial equity habit building challenge. And um, he challenged us this last weekend, he was the keynote at the conference I was at, to broaden our interpretation of equity and diversity into some of these. So he shared that his struggle is understanding things like gender and sexual orientation and how those words play in our society. Um, this, he does the White Privilege Institute. So this one is particularly around race and largely around uncovering white privilege. But um, I took his materials and put them on a checklisty Google spreadsheet. So you can go through and see all the tabs and all the resources. It's hyperlinked to him because I fully want to give him credit. I just liked the pretty design of being able to click off and sort of measure what I had done in each of the categories. So you can make a copy of that. 
And I think in the notes of this one, I gave you um, Peggy McIntosh's Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, which is a great article um, and checklist along those same lines. But if you haven't seen it, I would recommend. Audience participation. So right at the end of the talk about, I feel like she and I are friends. Um, I have a button for anyone who can tell me what this is a picture of accurately. You can tell me lots of things, right? I have a button for someone who's willing to guess. It's after lunch. That's a good guess. I get lots of like cheetah, leopard. I do not love this after being there. <laughs> One more guess. What do you think? Cloud formations. Cloud formations. It's a squirrel. So this is one of those magic eye things where once you see it, you can't unsee it. Here's his head, and here's his bushy little tail, and he's standing in front of a snow pile. Here's his head, and here's his bushy squirrel tail and his little legs. So you can see sort of his silhouette there, and that's just a snow pile in the background. Um, I asked students to take something familiar and make it strange. So they took their iPads, they happened to have, you could use any device, right, to take a photo. They used their favorite photo editing app, and we used this as a launch for a discussion about how perspectives are different when it's new to you, and how we can sort of change the narrative. This is a fifth grade group of kids. Um, I've had adults do this in sessions. We come up with some really cool things, but she talks about this idea of making the familiar strange and when we can disrupt that narrative of what we think we know in our head, like how we can see things differently. And so I just wanted to throw in like a quick example of what that might look like in the classroom. So I gave you all the teacher examples. Turn to someone near you. What opportunities do you or could you offer to raise awareness for that of your students? So for yourself or for your students in your classroom. Is there something you already do, a book you recommend, you want to share with your partner? Go ahead and take a minute or so. Does anyone have a book? I know I didn't give you long to talk. The first five times I did this presentation, I did not run out of time. And now the last three that I'm ever going to give it, I'm going to not even come close. Um, does anyone have a book or a blog or a podcast or something that you might recommend to help sort of broaden interpretation or understand yourself? Or Yeah. I just thought I like the podcast Code Switch. Very cool. And I love when people share podcasts because I'm trying to make myself a podcast person. I'm just not there yet. Yeah. Um, there's Bridget Story, which mm -hmm. looks like when I had an app on my phone that was not always bring up the website. And I just usually anywhere from one to five minute stories about people all over the world doing amazing things. Mm -hmm. So it shows different cultures, languages, the subtitles. Yeah, 
I have it on my bookshelf, but that's all the farther I've gotten. I, our English teacher led it this summer, and she took a look at how to save school culture um, in the classroom, as a reminder from the classroom thing, and she, they read that book, and she's swears by it and really wants me to use it in my principal's and one services class. So. Mm -hmm. The 57 bus? Oh, I was trying to be helpful and look up the author of your book, and I realized that this is the one that I struggle to say. It's like Ijoma something. And I should just like listen to a video of her pronouncing her name. I agree. <laughs> yes. Um, but that is a good one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have five minutes left. I am not going to get through all the things. So, I want to point out what's in here for you. Um, Cornelius Minor again. So there's some other pieces around engaging students as learning partners. I love to highlight, I love our TLC program, I love instructional coaches, but I wonder how we can model that more closely in the classrooms, where the teacher is the role of the coach and the student is more directive of their own learning. Um, where we can really give them voice and agency, and what would that look like to go through coaching cycles with your kids? And so I really, that partnership piece, I think goes right hand in hand with building relationships. Um, we wanna think about reducing social emotional stress from stereotypes and microaggressions, and then cultivating positive mindset. The one I wanna pull up here is StoryCorps. Um, it is an app. They have a website. I don't think you can create on the website.